Well, today we're going to be discussing, I'm going to delve into the subject of the God of order. Part of the responsibility of anyone who is called to deliver the Word of God, whether by teaching or by preaching or by any other means, part of my responsibility is to connect the activities of heaven and connect the will and the purposes of heaven with that which is taking place on earth. Part of the responsibility is to recognize, my, my responsibility is to bring you to a place where you recognize on a daily, perhaps hourly basis, that that which is taking place on this earth, where we currently dwell, is not disconnected from that which is taking place in the spirit realm and in the heavenlies. That they have much to do with each other. They are not they are not disconnected. They are inseparable in their, in their um, uh, communication with one another and in their joint activities. And today we're going to discover some of that as we explore what the Bible has to say about the God of order. We're going to choose a scripture that is a little bit unusual. It comes from the oldest book in the Bible, Job, the 25th chapter, and verse 2. And it is a statement that is true then and it is true today. It says, dominion and awe belong to God. He establishes order in the heights of heaven. Dominion and awe belong to God. He establishes order in the heights of heaven. Now, to say we're living in interesting times would be an understatement. To say we're living in confusing times uh, would be a polite statement in regards to what's happening in our nation and in the world. I can, ensure, I can ensure you that in our travels out west, in our travel to the conference that we attended, the prayer conference in Colorado Springs, and then the subsequent days that we took to go to a couple of the other nearby states and take a few days of, of vacation, I can assure you that that the craziness is not isolated to Ohio. In fact, I would subject to you that, suggest to you that maybe there may even be a little more craziness in some of the states out west than there is here. It is a confusing day to say the least. We're living in a unique time. You and I are living in a time in which there is a tremendous coordination of the dissemination of propaganda on a daily basis, on an hourly basis, almost on a minute by minute basis. We were just told this week, in fact, as an example, by some of the most powerful voices in America, that our borders are secure. And they, and they told us that with a straight face, actually. And we were also informed, and by the way, our borders are not secure, in fact, I just read yesterday that uh, it was recently discovered, a new discovery, that not only are our borders open and porous and approximately 8 million uh, illegal aliens have entered this nation in the last four years, but actually a new report reveals that since 2022, the current administration secretly flew over 320,000 illegal aliens into the United States over our airlines. And so there is, a, there is a purposeful agenda that is flooding our nation with illegal aliens of which we have no ideas to their background, we have no ideas to their health status, much less their criminal status, and it is being evidenced by recent um, reports and by those arrests that are being made that there is a good number, a great number of purposeful criminals entering the United States to do our nation harm. And yet you and I were told today, again with a straight face, we were told this week that our borders are secure. We are living in a time in which propaganda, the purposeful release of information meant to manipulate, and this is not a message on manipulation, but nevertheless, that's what's going on, is being released at such a level that you and I are literally being engulfed with it every day. And then, then this past week, we were also told that the United States is better off financially than ever in the history of our nation. I, I was just astounded because, really, I, I just recently got into a conversation just a couple of days ago while shopping, who this past week, they must not have gotten the memo that our finances are better than they've ever been. And uh, in reality, we are living in an incredible time of inflation. 
Since COVID, inflation has been off the chart and it isn't slowing down. Greed has taken such a bold face that it's chosen to hide behind the excuses of supply, supply issues and they've used every excuse they can to raise prices. Inflation is hiding behind COVID, still hiding behind COVID, still hiding behind supply chain issues. Now they're blaming the war in Ukraine. You name it, they, they'll blame it. In fact, I was just talking to an elderly gentleman a couple days ago who said he received his bill when he was at a restaurant, one of our larger chain restaurants. He happened to notice upon inspection of the bill, there was a $3 charge on there. He asked the waitress, what's this $3 charge? She said, oh, that's a service charge that we're now charging everyone. We just added that to our bill. And he, cut from the same cloth as I am, evidently, he said, well, you've just lost a customer because I'm not going to pay a tip and pay exorbitant prices for the food and a $3 service charge. But we're living in a day, it's craziness. We're living in a day of absolute craziness. And the prices continue to go up, but you and I were informed this week by those who are in those who are in the know, that that's just a figment of your imagination. Inflation really isn't, go it, things aren't going up. That's just your own imagination. You're in better shape financially than you've ever been in your life. You just don't know it. We're living in a time, again, of propaganda. We're, so if you think you're paying more for groceries and more for gas and more for everything, you're wrong because actually you're better off. And just listen to those who are in power and they'll let you know. So we're living in a confusing time. And we're also in a season when we're in tremendous decision making regarding those who will lead our government. We have an election coming up in a few days and it's incumbent upon those who call themselves United States citizens, much less those who are Christian, that you vote. Don't complain. You know, don't complain about what's going on in our nation or in your neighborhood or in your region if you don't take the time to vote. Vote and vote, and vote biblical values. Vote scriptural values. Make sure you know what the candidates believe. To the best of your ability, research them. I was talking to someone the other day on the phone and they were talking about a certain candidate and I mentioned something. They said, I know because I've gotten online and I've done my own research and I've delved, delved into it. I know exactly where they stand. And I said, good for you. Good for you for taking the time to make sure you're voting in the right way. We are in a very critical period in our nation. I know you've heard me say that, but I cannot overemphasize it. We are in a time of great decision making as far as the future of our nation. We're also in a season when the people of God, ladies and gentlemen, you're, we're going, the church of Jesus Christ is going to have to grow up and mature. And the church of Jesus Christ is going to have to find their voice. In this woke revolution, we're going to have to rise up and say no. And we're going to have to do this over and over again. We're going to have to say no. You're, we're not going to allow you to take us here. We're not going to allow you to have our children. We're not going to allow you to destroy our history. We're, you're not going to force me to use language that is false and condoning of immorality. You're not going to lie to us without pushback because we are going to call you out on it. It's time for the church. They, many, many people have this false idea that because I'm a follower of Christ that I am to be some type of meek and mousy and, and quiet individual that never pushes back, complacent in the face of aggression, and that is not the case at all. Our Lord was a Lord that when standing up against uh, unrighteousness and, and wrong action took a whip and cleared the temple of all the people who were there. That's the Lord that we serve. And you and I have a responsibility. We're going to have to find our voice, ladies and gentlemen. And I've told you before, they're not, they're not going to stop. Excuse me. They're not going to stop until we stop them. And so please. Now, having said all of that, that's, and by the way, that's, that's negative church growth preaching right there. <clears throat> That's how to reduce the number of the people who attend your church. But I can tell you that unless the church of Jesus Christ wakes up and really puts on her, her, her britches and girds up her loins 
and does what she's supposed to do, our nation is over. It's gone. Because if we think that an election and replacing individuals in places of power, as important as that is, because elections are vital and critical, but if we think we are at a point in our nation where we, through our own strength and through our own elections and through our own abilities, can turn the nation around, we are sadly mistaken. Because this nation will not turn around. This nation needed the help of God, and our forefathers were wise enough to recognize this in the beginning, that they needed the help of Almighty God to establish the nation, and we are sadly, ridiculously misinformed and fooling ourselves if we think we're going to turn this around without the help of Almighty God. We need all of God's help that we can receive. Our only survival is revival. That's the only way that we're going to make it. Now, revival, and I'm going somewhere with this, so hang on to your notes. Don't throw them away yet. But, but revival, some people would say, yes, oh yes, we need revival, Pastor. I am 100% in agreement. But they somehow have this erroneous idea in their mind and in their theology that revival, with whatever it means, and many times people who attend church don't even know what revival means. They think it's some kind of a special church service. But real revival, as you've heard me uh, explain in the past and we have discovered in the past, is impactful to a whole society. Real revival is earth-shaking. Real revival will shake a society to the very core and will change the values by which that society lives. Real revival will begin in the church, but it will spread like fire into the surrounding communities and into the surrounding society if it's really a quote-unquote awakening revival from God. But real revival does not just take place. That just doesn't happen when God says it's time to happen. If we think that real revival is just up to God, that's as foolish as Christians who tell me that they don't vote, they just pray. It's, it requires effort on our part. It requires a cooperation. There is action on earth that precipitates action in heaven. Charles Finney some who consider him the father of the second great awakening in our nation. Charles Finney, by the way, a lawyer who was converted and came to Christianity and became a preacher of the gospel, a Presbyterian preacher of the gospel. Charles Finney, the father of the second great awakening, whose fire of God followed him wherever he went, he very much preached and taught that revival is merely the outcome of certain sets of actions in agreement with the will of God. And so revival is as much a responsibility of human effort to align itself with the order of God as it is of God's supernatural power being released. And so having said all of that, I want us to take a look at what the Bible says about God being a God of order and how the order of God affects and impacts what happens on earth and how our actions and how our movements in, on earth in alignment with the order of God has a great power and power is released when that alignment takes place. Well, first of all, let's establish, number one, God is a God of order. And we've already, already read that in the text, that God brings about order in the book of Job. He, he, he is a God, it is, it is clearly indicated in that scripture and in many other scriptures and in evidence around us, even in creation, that our God is a God of order. Creation reveals this. It's incredible the intricacy and the balance and the fine-tuning and the precision that we find evidenced around us in creation. That's why it makes it all the more ludicrous and asinine, in my opinion, 
for those who consider themselves to be extremely educated to somehow assert that all of this just came about without causation. And they always talk about causation, but they try to somehow come up with infinite efforts of, of extrapolation of logic to bring about all of this without the involvement of a deity, without the involvement of God. But all of this, the Bible says, the heavens declare the glory of God. And I just read last night in Dr. Hugh, one of Dr. Hugh Ross's book, An Astrophysicist, he said that we are uniquely positioned, and I don't have time to go into it, and I'm quite fr frankly, I'm not quite sure I totally understand everything he said, and I'm not sure that maybe, I'm sure some of you are smarter than I am and you would get it, but we are uniquely positioned in the universe in where we're at and located that the earth is uniquely positioned that it provides us the ability to look into the heavenlies and to actually see the expansion of the universe that is taking place. Were we in 85 to 90 percent of the other galaxies, all of that would be impossible to look out on a clear night and see the stars the way that we see them. And this earth is so, is so intricately and precisely positioned, and the sun and the planets. In fact, just an example for you, God's a God of incredible order and precision in his book, Case for a Creator, Lee Strobel refers to one of the top scientists at Cambridge University, former spiritual skeptic Martin Rees, who was once named by Queen Elizabeth Astronomer Royal. After much research, he could not ignore the incredibly choreographed cosmic parameters that create a life-friendly universe. And here's what he said, the expansion speed, the material content of the universe, and the strengths of the basic forces seem to have been a prerequisite for the emergence of the hospitable cosmic habitat in which we live. Well, let me give you an example of what he's saying in some plain language, if I can. For the universe to exist as it does requires that hydrogen be converted to helium in a precise but comparatively stately manner. By the way, collapsing stars, supernova, all of that which takes place when you see a star burn out or something happen like that, that is a hydrogen-helium balance that's going on there. Hydrogen be converted to helium in a precise but comparatively stately manner, specifically in a way that converts, listen to this, one thousandth of its mass to energy. Lower that value slightly, from 0.007 thousandths of a percent to 0.006 thousandths of a percent, and no transformation could take place, and the universe would consist of hydrogen and nothing else. Raise it to 0.008 percent, and that hydrogen would have been exhausted long ago. In short, move the dial one thousandths of a percent in either direction, and the universe we now live in would not exist. It just wouldn't happen. In fact, Hugh Ross in his one chapter talking about the fact that the earth is the perfect planet for life gives 66 scientific reasons that earth is the perfect place out of all of the galaxies, even as far as they can see, just for carbon-based life. In fact, they know no other form of life than carbon-based life. All of this, all of this, in fact, I, I wish I had more time because even the thickness of the crust of the earth is perfect so that we can survive on the earth. Any thinner, any thicker, we would not be here. All of these things, 66 reasons of a perfect balance where we are in conjunction to the sun, in, in, in as far as, excuse me, in relationship to the sun, the size of the sun, the size of our moon, the fact that Pluto is positioned where it's at so that it takes two to 3,000 more hits from asteroids than the, than the, and, and from, from meteorites than the Earth does, that it blocks us where it's positioned. All of these things did not just come to be. It is because there is an incredibly intelligent being, God, 
who put all of this into place perfectly, precisely timed, precisely ordered. There is a God of order that has ordered everything as you and I see it for the very purpose of your existence and my existence. God is a God of order. And all throughout the Bible, we see evidence of the fact that God demands and operates by order, not just in creation, but in everything that he does. From the account of creation to the book of Revelation, we see a consistent theme of order throughout the Bible. In fact, in Numbers 10, 28, and we don't have time, I wish we had time to go through, look up, do a word study on the word order. And this was the order of march for the Israelite divisions as they set out. Even as the divisions were setting out and, and the tribes would set out to march somewhere, God said, have them set out in this order. And then when God set up the tabernacle and the place of worship, he instructed Moses to do everything exactly the way he told him. In fact, he uses the word exactly. God tells Moses, do it exactly the way I'm telling you to do it. Why did he tell him to do that? Because he said it will be a copy of what is in heaven. God said to Moses, as you establish the order in the worship of the tabernacle and how you worship me, put everything, the candlesticks, the brass laver, the water, how you do it, put it exactly in this order because it will match the order that is in heaven. And in 2 Chronicles 29, 35, it says, so the service of the house of the Lord was set in order. Everything God does, he does in agreement with an established order. God acts, he moves in agreement with his established order. God just doesn't react. God is, a not, God is not a God of reaction. God is a God of action. And every action he takes, every move he makes is a predetermined move of order. It is established according to his pattern, according to his order. What may seem like an act of God on the part, act on the part of God that brings chaos is actually a result of him bringing something into order. And that chaos may ensue for a little while, but the end result of the chaos of the activity of God will always bring order. God just doesn't shoot from the hip. So as in creation, God's order in heaven. Heaven is a place of order. Heaven is a place not of confusion. There is not chaos in heaven. There isn't chaos ever in God. He is a God of order. He's methodical. And the order in heaven is in keeping with his perfection and his character. The order in heaven, let us say it this way, is so because he is so. Now, what is he? So what? So what? God is holy. God is love. God is light. God is good. God is just. We could go on and on. And the order of God in heaven is for a purpose of keeping with who he is. So to you and I, what may seem to be totally random and maybe even ridiculous a required detail that God has required, even in reading the Old Testament, some of these details, why would he require that is actually and always keeping in with who he is? Who he is. Now how, how often, remember with me, how often Jesus would say to his disciples, what I am doing now, you don't understand. You don't, you don't understand what I'm doing now. I get it. You don't know why I'm doing this. To you, this seems crazy. He told his disciples this over and over again. What I'm doing now, you don't understand. He said, but someday you will understand. So what was Jesus saying? The Son of God, what was he saying? He was saying that what I'm doing, the actions I'm taking to you may seem random, ridiculous, chaotic, make no sense, but they are really, I am walking in order and in agreement with God the Father's order and plan. Just as God had specific order and plan and purpose in the Old Testament, God is still a God of order today. He was in the New Testament. His Son walked in order at, at, according to the obedience to the Father, and you and I are also 
walking and are to walk and live, and the church is to be prescribing to the order of God and as God has revealed. So the second thing that we must recognize is God demands and awaits order on earth. God not only is a God of order, but he's waiting on order on earth. He demands it, as we've already seen. He instructed Moses. He instructed many others throughout the Old Testament, gave them very specific directions. Do this, do this at this time in this way. But he's also still a God of order today, and he awaits order on earth. God will suspend his activities and his actions. He will suspend activities and action on earth even though desiring to do so until man, until you and I as individuals or even societies line up with his order, his prescribed order that he has established in heaven. Exactly what I said before in Exodus, the 25th chapter, he said to Moses, make this tabernacle and all its furnishings exactly like the pattern I will show you. God still God still expects, demands, and communicates that you and I subscribe and prescribe our lives according to the pattern that he has given to us. In fact, another strange verse, Ezekiel, the 21st chapter, God is speaking to the prophet, uh, speaking to Ezekiel. And in that day, God spoke through the prophets different than he does today, simply because we all have the ability to have the Holy Spirit. But God said to Ezekiel in Ezekiel 21, man, son of man, strike your hands together on earth. Son of man, Ezekiel, strike your hands together on earth. And when you do that, I too will strike my hands together in heaven. That's Ezekiel, the 21st chapter, verse 14 and verse 17. There we see a coordination and a cooperation and a co-joining of efforts between man and God. God says that when you do this on earth, I will do this in heaven. God is saying, I have an order in heaven. I have something I'm going to do in heaven and it will be done when you do it on earth. And when you do it on earth, I will do it in heaven. And then the effect and the impact and the manifestation of the power and that which is needed on earth. Do you understand, ladies and gentlemen, that things don't just happen on earth? Do you understand that there are spiritual forces at work, both evil and the forces of God's holiness and goodness at work? There is a cosmic struggle going on that you and I are the center of all creation universe attention, that God and a, a being called the devil are battling over the souls and the future of mankind that Christ came to give us the victory through his death on the cross. The Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. And yet we are in that time that's called the already and not yet, where the victory has been won and assured by Christ. The tomb is empty, as we're going to celebrate in a couple weeks, but you and I are still in a war, still in a battle, and God has involved us in it, and he wants to communicate through us, and he wants to work with you and with us to do his work within this earth. But that only is released when we, as the church of Jesus, Jesus Christ and we as individual Christians line ourselves up with the God of order in heaven. There is a saying that says that when the pattern is right, the glory will fall. When the pattern is right, the glory will fall. What you're praying for, what we need, what our nation must have, what we must see happen will only happen when the order on earth of those followers of Jesus Christ, when the followers of Jesus Christ, the church of Jesus Christ, of which he is the head, aligns itself and puts itself into order on earth as God has demanded the order be in heaven. And so he demands and awaits order on earth. And order has to do with alignment and agreement. You've heard me talk about this before. In 2 Samuel, the fifth chapter, we find that David has been appointed king. 
And the Philistines come against him to test him, to test his mettle, to test his military. He goes out against them. He defeats them. They go back and lick their wounds. And, and, and they, they reassess their, and, and regroup. They come again, the Bible says, against David, against Israel. They just won't go away. David, it says, he was a man of war. He was not afraid. He defeated Goliath. David says, I'm going to go out against him again. So he begins to prepare his army and says, let's go get him again. And the prophet of God says to David, no, wait. Wait this time. Do not go straight out against them. In 2 Samuel, the fifth chapter, verse 24, it says, wait until you hear the rushing in the mulberry trees. That's not an accurate translation. A better translation is wait until you hear the sound of marching in the tops of the poplar trees. Another Arabic translation says, wait until you hear the sound of horses' hooves above you. Can you imagine how strange that was, that God allowed them to hear with their human ears the, how, the sound of the spiritual army of heaven going out over them. And God says, when you hear them go out, then you go out. And as we go out together, as the order of heaven and the order of earth align and and agree with each other, you will defeat your enemies. God is awaiting on alignment and agreement by his church here on earth. And he's doing everything that he can by the power of his spirit and even through preaching like this to awaken those who will be awakened. Those who have ears to hear and will hear. Not everyone will hear, but we are in those critical days when God is sounding forth the trumpet and he is causing certain pastors and churches and those pastors who are willing. I don't believe that God is any respecter of persons. I believe his spirit will reveal truth to every pastor and he wants them to declare, listen church, line up with the order of heaven and if you will, victory will be yours and you will see your nation revived and impacted by the power of heaven and we will see society reversed as only God can do when you line up and get into alignment and agreement with heaven. <clears throat> I'm moving. I've already covered this, but when that happens, power is released. Nothing can stop it. The devil can't stop it. <clears throat> the woke crowd can't stop it. Evil politicians can't stop it. Nothing can stop it. God has promised that if you and I will align with the order of heaven, He will do it. But you and I have something to do with that. God has revealed His order in His Word. It isn't a secret. God never kept anything a secret from Moses. He said, do it exactly as I tell you to do it. God hasn't kept His will a secret. God is not keeping His will or His order a secret today. Romans 15 says, for everything that was written in the past was written to teach us. It was written to teach us. Micah 4, 2 says, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. So this expectation of following God and his order is not only for nations. It wasn't just for Israel or even our own early nation and our forefathers, but it applies to you and I as individuals. Now let me tell you something, if you spend more time watching the news, or on your phone, or on Facebook, or on social media, or whatever, then in the Word of God, you are, you are going to lose your faith. What do I mean by that? You, you will come to church on Sunday morning, or someone will make a statement to you about what God can do and you will not believe it because what you're listening to has amplified the problems and they are immense that we are facing more than you have seen God's power and ability within His Word. You're living more in this world and you're listening more to this world than you are to the Word of God. So you will lose your faith. And you'll have to come to church on Sunday morning for somebody to pump you up every Sunday. But you will lose it. You will not have it. You'll reach back for it and it won't be there. Unless you get in the Word more than you're in the news or on social media or on Facebook. And we also will not only lose our faith, you'll lose your way. 
You will not know the pattern of heaven. You will not know the order of heaven. The only place that it's found is in here. Believe me, Fox News, CNN, they're not giving you the order of heaven. Only the order of heaven is found in here. You say, I don't understand why I'm having so much difficulty. I don't understand why I'm so discouraged. I don't understand why I have no overcoming victory. Maybe the first thing you need to do is to check your life and say, where am I in regards to reading the Bible and in following my life, putting my life in agreement and in order with God's order? Because God has promised that when I put myself in alignment with his order, when I put myself in agreement with his pattern and his plan, and only then, he won't make any exceptions. He doesn't say, well, you're kind of special. Out of the hundreds of billions that have existed, you're a special one. I'm just going to ignore everything I said. God says, no, you line up with what I have established, and I will make you an overcomer. Now, that doesn't mean we're not going to face trials. The Bible says we are. The Bible says we're going to be even persecuted. But the Bible says that he will make us more than an overcomer. So my question to you is, God has revealed it in his word. Are you finding his pattern and his order for your life? Are you reading his word? It's found in here. When the order and pattern on earth reflects the order of heaven, victory comes. Victory comes. When the pattern is right, the glory will fall. It's over and over again in the Bible. Let's use the example that we were using, Exodus 38. And God said, make everything exactly the way I told you to make it. Well, let's follow that story. Then Moses, it says in Exodus 40, 33 and 34, it says, Moses set up the courtyard around the tabernacle and altar and put up the curtain at the entrance to the courtyard. He was finishing everything up. And listen to this. It says, and so Moses finished the work. He did everything exactly as God told him to do. He didn't know what was going to happen. He just obeyed the Lord. He didn't have any idea. He just knew that God said, do it this way, this way, this way. To him, it may have made no sense whatsoever. But he did everything God told him to do. And then the Bible says, so Moses finished the work. And then look what it says, very, the very next verse. Let us notice, then the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. When the pattern is right, the glory will fall. When the pattern is right, the glory will come. That is an order of God. That is a principle of God. That is a promise of God. That if you and I get ourselves lined up with the pattern of heaven, if our church, if our nation, and we don't have to have the whole nation, all it takes is a remnant. All it takes are people around the, the, the nation of, of the United States, churches like this congregation and other congregations to say we are going to obey God. God is God. God is the Lord. And we're going to line ourselves up with God's holy order. It means we're going to have to sacrifice some things. It means I'm going to have to stop doing some things and I'm going to have to start doing some things. It means that I'm going to do some things that may not be so pleasant to my flesh, but I'm going to line up. And the Bible says when we do that, God's glory will fall. And ladies and gentlemen, every, thing, every time God's glory falls, there is power released on earth. Unexplainable, inexplicable power that begins to affect whole societies. Whole nations are impacted when that happens. So what about today? We see a nation spinning out of control. We see chaos ruling and reigning. We see a call for more chaos. A call for more for, for, to put the foot on the gas pedal, to continue in the direction we're going. How can we stop that? God has given us the pattern. God has revealed the pattern. Line up with the pattern. The pattern is in 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If my people who are called by my name, not if the devil's crowd, not if the woke crowd, not if those who are God-haters. It says, if my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then, then will I hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin. And what will happen? I will heal their land. When we line up, what's holding up God? We are. What's holding up the victory? We are. 
God's pattern is established. His order is waiting. Heaven is pregnant with power. Heaven is pregnant to give birth to what we need. But it's up to the church. And by the way, on the Day of Atonement in the Old Testament, the first people who had to repent were the priests of God. They were the ones who first had to repent. This is not something new. This is not something that only our generation has faced. This isn't something that's just unique to us. In 1777, in our own nation, while seated next to John Adams in Congress, Benjamin Rush recorded in his journal that he leaned over and whispered into John Adams' ear this question. He said, do you think the American colonies will succeed in their struggle with Great Britain? He said, Adams, and these are his words, this is Benjamin Rush's recording of Adams' words. Adams quickly turned to him and responded. He said, yes, if we fear God and repent of our sins. That is the form, one of the former, two of the former founding fathers of our nation. Extremely, incredibly intelligent men. Educated, in, to, unbelievable, the, the amounts of material they could quote and the way they could speak. And yet, what did they say? They didn't say, yes, if we'll do this or we'll do this or we'll do this. He said, we need to repent and we need to fear God and God will give us victory. Ladies and gentlemen, we are almost at the point of no return. We are at a Nineveh moment in this nation. And the responsibility is ours. It always has been. In the conference we were just at, a couple of Sunday nights ago, Dutch Sheets, who is a speaker, uh, if you watch YouTube, give him 15. Dutch Sheets was speaking. And he was talking about this very subject out in Colorado Springs. He was preaching about this. And he said, the good news is this, that we're beginning to see signs of life and signs of hope. He said that a Christian leader from China contacted him and said that he wanted him to know that four to five million Chinese Christians are praying for America every day. And Dutch Sheets didn't believe it, so he checked into it. And he found out that the Christian leader was telling the truth. I don't have time to tell you how he found out, but he found out telling the truth. Four to five million, a very conservative estimate, Chinese are praying for America to be revived and saved every day. Why? He said he asked them why, and here's what they said. Because we know if America falls, the world falls. If we fall, the world falls. Now, when will the church in America wake up? When will we wake up? There is signs of life. I'm hearing preachers that are beginning to trumpet the call, that are beginning to say, look, we've got to repent. We have got to get our lives right with God. And we've got to line up with His order. And if we'll call on God and humble ourselves, He will do that which we cannot do in our own strength. Billy Graham said this in 2012, My heart aches for America and its deceived people. The wonderful news is that our Lord is a God of mercy and He responds to repentance. In Jonah's day, Nineveh was the lone world superpower, wealthy, unconcerned, and self-centered. But when prophet Jonah finally traveled to Nineveh and proclaimed God's warning, people heard and repented. Billy Graham said, I believe the same thing can happen once again, this time in our nation. Ladies and gentlemen, our nation needs to line up. Our church needs to line up. God is a God of order. And when we get the pattern right, His power flows. His victory comes. His help is released. What about you? Are you living under the blessing of God? One time, some time ago, God had made me aware that I had a pattern in my life that was distasteful to Him and sinful. 
And I repented. I remember where I was at. I was in the garage. And I said, God, forgive me. And God said, I don't want you to do that anymore. And I said, no, I won't, Lord. I won't, Lord. And I thank you for your forgiveness. And then God made a statement to me that was shocking. He said, Tim, would you rather live under my mercy or under my blessing? Would you rather live under my mercy or under my blessing? America, America, God shed his grace on thee. God bless America, land that I love. Stand beside her. And not just America, but what about you? Is the blessing of God on your life? Are you overcoming? Are you in a time of trial and temptation? Are you in a struggle? Are you in a battle? But do you have a sense of God's presence? Do you have a sense of God's overcoming power? You should. We do go through trials. We do go through temptations. We do go through battles. But God has decreed that you be an overcomer. Let's check our hearts. John Adams had it right. Do you think we can prevail? Yes, he said. If we fear God and repent of sin. Let's you and I make up our mind. We're going to fear God. We're going to walk in righteousness, holiness. We're going to be quick to repent. We're going to line up with God's order. When we do, when we do, and I believe with all of my heart, I believe with all of my heart that God wants to win this. I believe with all of my heart that God wants America. Not because we're something special. I believe because we preach the gospel. And I believe God, I believe with all of my heart that God wants America. And He's waiting on us to line up. Line up with His order. Line up with His pattern. And He will save America again. He will save us. He will save our families. He will save this generation. He'll reach this generation if we will follow the pattern. When the pattern is right, the glory will fall. I'm after God. I'm after God. I'm doing everything politically I can do. You say, well, you shouldn't say that. I don't care if I should say it or not. I'm doing everything politically I can do. I'm doing everything practically I can do. But I'm also pursuing God, <clears throat> first and foremost, because I want to see America saved. I want to see your family saved. I want to see you in victory. I want to see you walk in places you've never walked in before. I want to see you experience God like you've never experienced Him before. That's my heart burning. That's my heart fire, is to see God released here on this property and in our nation, in, a, in America today. How about you? Are you with me? We're going to see it done. We're going to get it done. We are going to see America saved. We're going to see God move. And we're going to know who did it. And we're going to give Him the glory. We're going to see miracles. Amen? We're going to see miracles. We're going to see the people that make fun of language like this and make fun of me and say, oh, you're just trying to pump them up. We're going to see them with their mouths shut because they're going to be amazed at what our God is going to do. God wants to win this. Do you want to win it? Well, let's leave with our heads high then. Humbled before God, but our heads high in that we're a child of God. We're not ashamed. And we're going to stand up and live as God would have us to live. Let's go out this week and take some ground for Jesus. What do you say? Let's go out this week and do something for God. Amen? I want you to wave and thank those men that have been standing out here with their, but, their, their buttons. Watch what I got to say here. <laughs> with their buttons. <laughs> buttons all buttoned up. 
and their hoods and they faced the back to the wind. They stood out here this whole time I preached. I want you to wave at them and let's give them a good car horn inside. Let's give them an applause. Thank you, gentlemen. All right, God bless you. Let's line up with God and see him work in our life. Have a wonderful week. God bless you.